Welcome all to a Coleman slash Clark Street Capital Webinar, Bank Industry Thoughts, Taking Back Our Advantage, all-star panel hosted by John Whitting, CEO of Clark Street Capital. The best way I describe John is he helps lenders balance their balance sheet in terms of buying assets or selling assets. Also joining us is Jason Kuyama, a shareholder of Godfried and Khan. Welcome Edward Hida, Senior Executive Advisor of Sakura Isaac Group. And unfortunately, we'll take the blame on this one, John. We can't get Christopher on video or on camera, but we certainly have him here on audio. Uh, he's the director of research for Janie Montgomery Scott. And uh, John, I believe this is the third or fourth webinar we've done, and all of them have been excellent. You do an excellent job on putting together content for our audience and bringing together these panelists to bring us up to date what's happening in the world. Hey. Uh, if for some reason you get disconnected, this is being streamed live on YouTube. We will also send out a link. There will be a poll in the middle of the presentation. Please answer that. That helps John and the presenters to craft their responses to make sure you're getting the best content available. And I think we all know the rest of the drill that you can adjust the screen and you can do what you want with the videos, all pretty good type of stuff. Um, Questions, please send questions to uh, put them in the chat box or send them to me directly at bob at colmanreport.com and I will be more than happy to get those over to John. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. And John, I'm going to let you tell us uh, how to take back our advantage. I didn't know we lost it, but I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I appreciate uh, the kind introduction. Um, this is the second go around for our original group. Um, we had an outstanding and topical one back in April, so we're bringing back the group. Um, we're going to start with a brief presentation from Chris Marinek, who's head of research at Janney, who's going to give us some thoughts on the bank earnings and how they looked. And uh, Chris is um, one of the leading analysts in covering the bank industry, especially the regional banks. So, Chris, take it away. Hey, John, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. So I'm going to give a just a high-level view of our earnings from the uh, second quarter of 2023 and then really get into some industry uh, dialogue as it pertains to deposits and credit and kind of where we think the uh, proverbial hockey puck is moving. So earnings for the second quarter um, largely were missing expectations uh, because of higher funding costs on both deposits and total cost of funds, as well as um, some continued reserve building. So from an earnings perspective, the good news was the banks were making money and tangible book value was largely uh, either flat, stable, or growing. Um, most companies missed earnings expectations because they were building reserves, as I mentioned, and also missing on net interest income, net interest margin. The reality is is I think expectations were relatively low for the quarter, number one. And number two, I think that there also has been a continuing reset of banks' um, deposit costs, given what not only transpired with the Fed the past 15, 16 months, but also what happened with the failed banks three failed institutions that occurred uh, in um, March and, and at the end of April. So from an earnings perspective, I think the market is looking ahead. We have seen bank stocks do better. That's largely because I think we have not seen any material credit problems emerge. The lack of earnings uh, in the quarter was more about this compression of, of spreads. We do think that is going to stabilize. I think a lot of companies were talking about that margins would bottom out by the fourth quarter of this year and then get slightly better. A lot of that is predicated on the fact that while deposit costs are low, they are changing and that the reset takes a few quarters, but it should not take multiple years. And that if anything, there was going to be a relatively quick surge in deposit costs, banks would reset and then catch up on loan and earning asset yields in the future. And we've started to see that play out, which is part of what I want to share with you today. So if we transition to some big picture comments, number one, uh, deposits have stabilized. Uh, that's slide two that we have here today. Um, we have seen deposits 
deposits get better since the end of May. Clearly, the failures of Silicon Valley, Signature Bank, and uh, First Republic led to deposit outflows and kind of an acceleration temporarily of deposit flows negative. But for the most part, that is stabilized. And if we look every Friday at the Fed reports and the Fed survey of the banking industry, you've seen deposits stabilize, if not go up slightly, since the third week of May. And so the graphs we have here that go back a few years, the um, yellow line uh, or orange line gives you the dollars outstanding on the left axis. The purple line is the percentage change year over year. And so, sure, we are down about 4% year over year as of uh, this week. But the reality is we're still way up from where we were at the end of 2019. So the um, analogy that I like to use, if you had $100 of deposits in your pocket at the end of 2019 pre-pandemic, that grew by 38%. And then it's now contracted um, about uh, eight to nine percent, and so you actually have had a hundred dollars become one hundred twenty nine on a net basis. And that still is pretty good given where the industry has. And I think the amount of deposits and excess deposits that we have as an industry are still very much intact, and that liquidity still matters. Banks are still in the process of lending that out, but it definitely has been a transition, and you're seeing banks pay up for funds uh, in a uh, in a material way that they weren't doing at the beginning of this year. So one of the advantages that I think banks have had, and it continues to be very good, but I think also misunderstood, is that there is a big difference between the Fed funds rate today at about 533 and where banks are pricing deposits. Uh, deposits and total funding, which again is borrowings plus uh, deposits for a bank, tends to be priced around 2%. And in a lot of cases, that's going to go to maybe 250 or 275 for most banks. But we're going to end up with at least two and a half, or in many cases, three points of a spread between the Fed funds rate and where the Fed lands, probably near 550, and where banks are going to be in that 250 to three percent range, all in. So, and that's kind of a, a look at where we think we're going to finish. 2023 as an industry. So the history that we share on page three, which is just a graph that we did back to, to 1990 for all FDIC banks, what you find is that that spread has been um, as you know good as two points, maybe 250, and it generally hung out around the 100 to 150 basis point range. So you know we are way wider than that today because of the level of Fed funds and the fact that you know banks still have this funding advantage. So while there has been a big change in the past 90 days and further cost increases in the next 90 days, we still think that big gap uh, between where Fed funds are, are and where banks are pricing deposits and total bar is still fairly wide. It's historically better than ever, and we think it is a key to understanding the banking system. So that advantage, as I showed on page four, has widened. Um, still think it'll be wide as we finish the year. And even if the Fed is going to go higher for longer, if that scenario were to play out, I still think there's a pretty big gap between where banks are. And one point I did not mention, but I will say here, is that the loan to deposit ratio for the banking industry is 70%. It's normally in the 83 to 85% range. Many institutions used to operate at 95 to 100. The industry was in that mid to upper 80s. So we're still a good 12, 13, 14 percentage points lower on loans to deposit for the industry. And that's true whether you look at small banks in the small bank data segment, or if you look at the largest banks in the country. Country, that loan to deposit ratio is lower today than it had been pre-pandemic and certainly back to prior rate cycles, particularly if you go back to where the industry last had its big um, Fed funds uh, surge, which was 2004 to 2006. So just some perspective. Um, we did a distribution analysis in our uh, weekly industry note. We call the weekly musings yesterday. We talked about the betas for loans, deposits, and funding, and distributed them. So you could see in these eight buckets, uh, majority of banks on uh, deposits and funding were above 80% in terms of their beta for the second quarter. That is simply the change or the increase in their cost of funds and cost of deposits relative to the change in Fed funds. Fed funds was up about 50 basis points on average in the second quarter. We expect it to be up another 30 basis points on average. Again, average for Q3 versus Q2. That's how we do these beta calculations. And then if you look at the next page on six, uh, we talk about the betas in the past year. 
This is simply the year-over-year comparison where the change in Fed funds has been 422 basis points, again, June of 22 to June of 23. It's not an entire cycle um, summary, just the last 12 months, but it gives you a perspective of where a lot of companies are in the 30% to um, to 50% broad range of betas here in the past year. Again, just food for thought. Um, We are seeing loan betas trailing deposit betas um, for the quarter and for the last year. Therefore, that's why you have net interest margin compression. So keeping it relatively simple, that's the why um, net interest margins have compressed. Um, A couple other thoughts for you. Um, Loan uh, growth has been decent, but at a slower pace. We think slower loan growth is going to continue to happen. We can talk about some of the bank capital rules during the Q&A session. Feel free to ask about those. We think most banks are going to go on a little bit of a diet uh, where they are going to lend less. Uh, Credit is definitely scarce. I think the biggest banks, the big regional banks, are going to do more of that dieting than others, but it definitely is a um, theme heading into the second half of the year and for 2024. Um, On the credit side, we really saw very few new problems. Um, Charge-offs were up slightly, uh, problem loans were up slightly, but at the end of the day, um, I did not see anything seismic here. We do think it's worthwhile, and we can get more into this in the Q&A, to think through how to you look at defaults and losses within the industry. And we thought the stress test was pretty helpful in that regard. The Fed stress test gave losses by major category, and then you can kind of back into what defaults may be. So we created a scenario that ended up having defaults, which therefore matched the losses by bucket for mortgages, CNI, uh, CRE, credit cards, and, and consumer lending. And that's part of the slide on page seven. And that's just uh, some you know unique Jenny analysis, but it's really just doing math on what the Fed already put out by the dollars of losses and the loss rates by those major categories. So point being, as we debate commercial real estate, as an example, we can kind of come up with a default rate um, in the in the teens and then um, uh, look at how those losses go. In fact, I actually think the, the default rate would be closer to 20% for all CRE. It'll vary by product type, which we can get into later because certainly office is everyone's concern. Office probably has more defaults than other types of uh, CRE, but you can um, you know, back into the broad CRE losses and um, defaults you know, through this um, methodology. We kind of created a uh, mental model to walk through that. Um, And in closing, just want to mention uh, what we think are kind of the positives and negatives for the industry at this point. Number one, scarcity of credit. Awfully important, clearly after the failures of the three banks in March and April, it is uh, a lot of banks being more careful. We still think they are lending. They're simply being more careful, asking for more rate, asking for more collateral. Um, I think that's ultimately good. For the amount of problems that the banks have, it should limit their issues as we go through this cycle. Um, We also see that banks continue to get more efficient. We think a lot of companies will announce expense initiatives uh, by the fourth quarter, take some one-time charges to kind of position their expense bases less for 24. We think you'll particularly see that in the regional banks as we enter into um, both the conference season in September as well as earnings season again in October. So look for more expense cuts and expense efficiency moves at the biggest banks. Um, And overall, I think expectations are low, which to me is a good thing because I think it is um, allow stocks to do better in that environment. Um, But make no mistake, we are going to see a credit cycle. We are going to see losses happen. Banks are not immune to this credit cycle. We just think it's going to be a modest level of problems and not something uh, that's going to mirror what happened in 2008, 9, and 10. And I, you know, will argue that I think with anybody, because we have, um, you know, less leverage today than we did 15 years ago. And ultimately that's going to help. Um, we do think the regulatory environment is uncertain. Uh, uh, we think some of these capital rules are still going to play out and that uh, it's going to create confusion. And ultimately, you still have the deposit pricing reset that's going to at least be for one more quarter, probably two. So, John, those are my main highlights coming out of earnings season and some big picture commentary. Um, I'll be here for the duration and happy to you know, add uh, as we talk through the Q&A session. Great. Uh, Jason or Ed, any any, any uh, thoughts on on Chris's presentation? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Chris, that's fantastic. And you know what I looked at, and I think your discussion, you know, talks a lot about is you know NIM compression really driving a lot of the agenda um, 
you know, currently there's other things as well. And I guess the way I'm, I guess, wondering maybe um, your thoughts, you know, the um, CRE and specifically office um, environment and, you know, kind of the overhang there, um, you know, from, you know, a lot of the data that uh, hasn't really hit yet as a major earnings driver, but, you know, I think you keep on seeing stories about, um, you know, whether people need to go back to work, you know, whether uh, companies need to renew their leases, um, you know, office vacancies, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, concentrated in, you know, some of the largest metropolitan areas, um, you know, in the country. And that seems like, uh, obviously, you know, we've talked about this kind of a, you know, different paradigm, you know, for working, but, you know, when does that start to hit, you know, the bottom lines? And I, I would tend to think, you know, we're going to see a little uneven effect, as we know, um, you know, a lot of that lending is concentrated in more of the mid-sized and smaller uh, banks. So, you know, and, and, you know, some of those have different, um, you know, holdings than others. So I'm just curious, you know, when and how that might play out. I know you started to touch on it a little bit there. So um, good question. And now I'll, I'll dig in from the top. I think that, you know, what happens in the industry is you have some big companies act as leaders and then everyone else follows. It's just been my experience uh, covering banks for a long time. So if you look at JP Morgan, look at Bank America, certainly Wells Fargo is a great example of this. They all built reserves in the quarter and they specifically mentioned real estate. Wells Fargo was probably the most open about adding two reserves in real estate. And I think it's a necessary evil. Um, you know, defaults are going to go up. You're going to have losses on those defaults and you have to get prepared for that. So what we've seen companies do is take reserves that used to be 1% or 1.5% in terms of a loss rate for CRE, take those significantly higher, go to 4 or 5%. I think the number is maybe closer to 8 at Wells Fargo. Um, that tells you what you really need to know is that there are losses there. Banks are preparing for those and they're getting ready to write those off. Now, what I mean by an 8% loss rate for well, Wells Fargo is they see defaults being high enough and losses being high enough that they think they're going to write off 8% of that office exposure. It doesn't mean the entire CRE book will be that high, but office particularly can be that that type of loss. And that actually makes sense to me. Um, that makes sense that you could see um, certainly across an entire book, maybe uh, you know, 20, 25% go bad, and then you're writing off a third of that. Now that's a broad number. And of course, in many cases, you've got way higher losses. But one of the things that I think we mentioned on our last call, and I'll reiterate today, is not every loan is a bad loan. You could have defaults, that actually trigger additional collateral, additional cash from a borrower, additional deposits, and that allows that loan to be performing and therefore kind of work itself through. You will see loans being restructured. As John knows, and I think we'll talk about, there's been some new rules or at least some guidelines put out by the regulatory agencies about how to restructure a CRE loan. It's not about kicking the can down the road. It's actually about having a roadmap to how you can resolve issues that you have, but sometimes you just simply need more collateral. Um, there are situations where banks are redoing loans and simply doing them with a different set of circumstances. And sure, they may not be at an 8% rate, but they are at terms that can get paid because the idea for the bank is to get cash flow and continue that loan as performing, uh, therefore avoiding having to you know, take the property on and therefore really incur an even worse loss. So reserve building is the theme. We think that will continue to happen uh, broadly for the banks and then more specifically on commercial real estate and particularly in office. And, you know, what I'm kind of, um, I think, happy about is the companies are putting a lot more information out so you can specifically see what they're doing in office. There's been some very good slides given by all the major banks in their um, second quarter presentations with the investment community. And I think you'll see more of that as this year plays out. You know, Chris, outside of the the updated rules that John will get into a little bit later here, um, given the fact that regional banks have a higher concentration of CRE than the larger money center banks do on a on a proportion basis, um, and in light of the fact that you said that you tend to look at the you know the market leaders, the JP Morgan's, the Wells, the B of A's, you know, for for what they did to their their reserves, their AAAL, do you see a disproportionate uh, Requirement might be the wrong word, but disproportionate guidance um, for regionals over the course of the next year and having to reserve much larger percentage than what you're seeing the uh, money centers do because they're going to be disproportionately hit by Siri or purportedly disproportionately hit. <laughs> 
So I think if you look specifically at CRE and, you know, the 10Q filings are just coming out this week for uh, the quarter, which has this additional detail, I suspect that the CRE specific allocations are not high enough. They are higher than they were at December 31st last year, but they're not high enough. So I think to some extent what Wells has done has set the tone and that many other of the mid-cap and regional banks have to follow. Um, my suspicion is for the moment, because defaults are low, um, those reserve numbers are okay. But I think if we look out the next 18, 24 months, defaults are going to rise. I just I don't see how they can't, um, you know, particularly as maturities come in. And a lot of banks talk about maybe 20 percent of their loans mature in the next year and change. But that, to me, is enough to trigger incremental defaults. So I feel like this is going to be an ongoing process every single quarter to add reserves. So I think the answer is they're not reserved enough on CRE, um, and they'll probably continue to increase allocations. That's kind of why I think you'll see. Um, you know, earnings have to have higher provisions from banks. Um, the CMBS universe is has a much higher concentration of, of office. Um, so, you know, your big high profile $100 million loans on downtown office buildings, it's going to be pretty rare that those are going to be loans held by a bank. They may be loans that are serviced by a bank through a CMBS deal. Um, but Office is 29% of all CMBS loans. So CMBS has a disproportionate share of the Office exposure. The other thing I would add is the vast majority of CMBS loans the last several years were interest only. Um, few banks do interest only loans. And most CMBS loans are non-recourse, where the vast majority of banks' uh, real estate loans would be recourse. So the ability to have recourse um, does allow banks to do some things with borrowers to right-size the loans that you might not be able to do with a uh, non-recourse loan. Excellent. Um, well, switching gears, um, you know, uh, all of you probably heard about the big merger between um, PacWest and Bank of California. Um, curious, Jason, uh, do you view this deal as being a template for future M&A deals? How and why? I mean, it certainly could provide a template in some very unique circumstances, which is, I think, what PacWest found itself in. Um, you know, it, it, it's been a cycle from the last time where we saw private equity really want to invest in a bank um, or having the regulators support that investment openly and in advance, well in advance of the deal. Um, and so, you know, it's showing some receptiveness by the regulators to allow uh, private equity money to come in to, to in essence, recapitalize a bank. Um, the unique aspect here, though, is really this aspect of um, control. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the weeds here for, for those that aren't M&A attorneys. And I'm certainly not an accountant, so I'm not going to get any accounting details. But there's really two definitions of control. There's the accounting definition of control and then there's you know control for regulatory purposes and um, prior to you know, inking and announcing this deal uh, the you know fed did look at the proposed structure and opined that warburg and centerbridge were not going to be deemed to have control which is a very low threshold percentage wise in the regulatory speak uh, it's not, you know, for those non-bankers that are on the phone, it's not, you know, 51%. It's a very low threshold, can be as low as 5% for control. And the way they got around that um, was, uh, was, I think, you know, a little inventive. Um, there's a lot of non-voting stock that Warburg and Centerbridge have acquired as part of this transaction. And as a result of having a non-voting stock, it doesn't necessarily, you know, allow them to exercise control over the bank. Um, there were warrants that were issued in connection with this transaction, but those warrants have mandatory exercise requirements that in essence require if the stock price hits a certain threshold, which I think is double what it was at the date of the announcement. Don't hold me to this. Uh, I'm not, I didn't work on this transaction. So yeah, I'm trying to you know, glean what information I can, but I think it's double what uh, the announced uh, threshold was, but certainly well below where PacWest was trading, you know, um, you know, months before this this, uh, this cycle happened. Um, and those mandatory exercise of warrants actually allow uh, 
the investors to invest at a significant discount. So in essence, they'd be you know paying a 25% premium, but the stock price would be significantly higher what they're paying. But in essence, it's an additional investment of capital into the into the uh, institution, um, which certainly helps uh, from a liquidity standpoint. The final piece where I think this is hard to harder to replicate is that Centerbridge and Warward um, generally do not have any seats at the board. Now, Warburg has a right to have a director at the board, but it's if their uh, common is below 5%. Uh, and there's a couple other triggers in there, but just for the sake of our discussion, we'll just say if the common is below 5%. So in essence, they get a seat at the board, but if they're, for whatever reason, their common exceeds 5%, it would appear, all again, although I wasn't you know, privy to the actual legal agreement, it would appear that they would no longer have a seat at the board. So, you know, John, is this a template? Yeah, it certainly is a template that allows uh, it shows a willingness of the regulators to allow outside private equity money into transactions. Um, it, oh, there's a piece I was missing here. The control is that the control is really at PacWest and not at uh, uh, the acquirers or at the investors um, in the sense of both accounting and regulatory control by percentage ownership and from an accounting perspective. And again, I'm not an accountant, I'm not get into this, but because the control is at PacWest, they didn't have to mark to market the securities portfolio uh, that was at PacWest, which was causing these illusory losses and these liquidity issues. Um, and so that was a huge you know, advantage. So that piece, I think, of having the uh, transaction for accounting purposes go in the reverse flow of the acquiring uh, uh, direction is probably a little easier to replicate. But the piece that adds the control uh, with these additional investors, I think is a little harder to replicate Although this transaction, if it shows any roadmap, it might show willingness of regulators to allow uh, some private money into transactions so long as that um, percentage of interest stays below regulatory control levels. Um, but it, it, you know, it's not the first time that uh, you know, m and attorneys like us have tried to structure, or investment bankers have tried to structure a transaction where the accounting flows in the reverse to try to save some losses. So I don't know if that, that piece is that unique, but that certainly is sort of the roadmap of where things are going. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, it could be a possible template for future deals. And on a, on a larger question, is m and back? Um, are the regulators more accepting of m and is the review process going to get easier? I know Janet Yellen has expressed some support for more regional bank regional bank mergers. And any thoughts on on um, how M and A uh, might pick up here? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. And um, actually, I was talking about exactly this with the regional bank CEO yesterday. And you know, from his seat, um, you know, he he just sees the landscape as kind of dead, you know, not, not a lot going on. And so I think the question is right though about um, what's the direction, you know? So, you know, it, it, it's um, clearly, um, you know, it hasn't been a lot of activity, but what's the direction? And I think you rightly pointed out, Janet Yellen has said that, um, you know, they'd be supportive of um, some mergers. Uh, Michael Hu, the um, control of the currency said that they would, you know, look closely at merger agreement, sort of his way of saying that, you know, they'd take an even-handed approach. Um, and interestingly, um, so there's, there's different um, kind of dynamics going on in the policy world. You know, they've indicated some uh, support. But on the other hand, um, you know, Liz Warren, who's on the um, Senate Banking Committee, has basically, um, you know, completely said that um, uh, both uh, Yellen and Michael Sue are, I think her words were taking the exact wrong approach. And the exact wrong lesson. So, you know, there's pressure being applied there. Then interestingly, um, you know, the Department of Justice has come out with kind of a, a number of changes to their part of the merger review. Uh, on the one hand, they said that they would expand the merger reviews from uh, just looking at um, deposits and branches to uh, much broader factors around the uh, two banks. Um, on the other hand, they said they'd be less involved in negotiating perhaps uh, branch divestitures or things like that as part of mergers. And so maybe a little even-handed, but um, they also ended up getting a lot of flack from uh, Liz Warren, who uh, said that that was also the exact wrong approach to take. So I think we're seeing some different messages. 
And then, and then of course, you know, at, at the largest bank level, um, there's still deposit caps, um, you know, for the mega banks. So I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a landscape though, where, you know, there's still 4,000 banks, in a, in over 4,000 banks in the U.S. Um, you know, clearly, you know, a lot of small to medium banks and, you know, probably some of them, are, you know, have some uh, difficulties and, you know, there'll probably be some activity over time on this. Chris, I mean, you talked to a lot of regional bank CEOs and CFOs. Are, are you getting some rumblings that some deals are coming? No, I actually think it's very slow, to be honest. I think that there's a wait and see attitude about uh, the Fed. Um, I do agree that the PacWest Bank of California deal is a really good litmus test. Um, you know, the company said that anywhere from uh, late December 23 to March of 24 is the time frame. Uh, it'll be interesting. I mean, uh, there are merger applications being filed around now, and so that gives you five months for it to get approved by New Year's Eve. Um, the Fed has a history of clearing their, de their, their desks out at year end, so maybe we'll get lucky. Um, I'm not counting on it, but it'll be interesting uh, to see if they really try to make it easier. Um, even if they approve this in March, it would be a win because the, the, the time frames we've been seeing have been over a year. It was 15 or 16 months with CIT and First Citizens. It was well over a year for M&T. Uh, First Horizon obviously didn't happen with TD, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we've seen a long time frame for the Fed and FDIC to a blessed deal. So if they can do it sooner in eight, nine months, that would be a win for the industry. And that's what we're uh, waiting for. I think there's a wait and see attitude among a lot of people. Um, as stock prices have some type of comeback, and if we're fortunate that they get stronger as the year finishes, um, that may change the M&A landscape. But for the moment, I think it's still uh, early innings on the uh, consolidation of the biggest companies. Yeah, John, you know, I want to clarify something, you know, just if there's any community bankers on the on the the, the webinar, um, Chris's comments were more directed at publicly traded and large regional banks in terms of timing. Historically, the past few years, we've seen timing for uh, community banks be um, you know, much shorter than a year um, in, in terms of you know, start to finish. Uh, I, I think that's changing a little bit. I don't want to say the regulatory review process is expanding, but the Time frame from start to end of a deal is expanding, uh, in part because of Ed's comments. There's greater risk uh, in transactions. I think the market is perceiving that. Um, there's greater regulatory risk for approval. And so any negotiated uh, agreement is going to have potentially a breakup fee um, for lack of regulatory approval, which is somewhat rare. It's not entirely you know, uncommon, but, but a little bit more rare. Um, so you're starting to see, you know, break of fees kind of leak their way into agreements there. You're also seeing a lot more requirements for deposit retention uh, and uh, prevention of deposit flowage out as part of a transaction, which is making it harder for people to come together on, on agreements. And I think the market's generally perceiving that. Um, what I think is the sort of the most unique piece of this year versus years past with M&A and this is at all levels, both community bank and, and regional bank, is the involvement of the regulators up front. It's not uncommon that when you're doing a transaction on the acquirer side, you will reach out to your primary regulators and you'll have an initial conversation with them and gauge their, their general reaction to your client doing a, a transaction. Um, and a lot of times it's just very cursory discussion and, you know, well, we'll you'll wait for the application, we'll let you know. Um, what my experience has been this year is a significant amount of involvement up front. Regulators asking a lot of questions, and uh, even before applications, asking for general performance. Uh, and I think that's their way of sort of saying, "Hey, we're not just rubber stamping these transactions anymore. We're going to take a harder look." Um, I'm in the middle of a transaction right now where both of the banks are uh, they've opted into community bank leverage ratio framework. Uh, and they do not risk weight their assets. Um, and the uh, primary regulator, which shares the, it's a Fed member bank, so the Federal Reserve has said, um, just as an FYI, we are requiring everybody to risk weight the portfolio, the combined portfolio on a performance basis, even though we know you and the target have opted into this framework. And that that's a huge change, in my opinion. And so that shows you the, that, yeah, deals are happening, but I think from a corporate perspective, they're harder to come by because uh, it's harder to come to agreement. And from a regulator standpoint, I think the, the, the Fed, certainly the Fed, but all regulators are taking a, 
a much harder look at these transactions. Yeah. Uh, we have a poll question uh, touching on the current regulatory environment. Due to recent events, how is the regulatory environment changing? Uh, bankers only, please. Um, no change, too early to tell. Moderately increased regulatory oversight, moderately reduced regulatory oversight, and significantly increased regulatory oversight. Well, no one's saying it's getting easier. <laughs> um, so pretty much split in half between too early to tell, no change, and an increase in regulation. Um, any thoughts on those results? I think it makes sense. Uh, I, you know, maybe would have expected a little more in the substantially increase, but um, you know, which seems to have been a trend for some time, but. Uh, it makes sense. Um, Ed, you, you know, we I know you, you posted on LinkedIn a few weeks ago regarding OCC changing their manual. Um, how have exams changed changed? Um, on that note, I mean, obviously, exam cycle can be lengthy, and not all banks have gotten an exam during this time period. But um, any color on that? Yeah, I think you know. For, first of all, um, you know, after the bank failures, obviously the regulators had published their lesson learned reports and, you know, among other things, they were rightly, you know, self-critical, including on the examination process. And they kind of talked about, um, you know, changes to come in that arena, um, the that and the FDIC primarily. Um, but actually the, the first, I think maybe tangible evidence that we saw of some regulator um, taking a stronger approach was with the OCC um, who issued uh, a new examination manual. And what was interesting in that examination manual was they added an appendix called um, Actions Against Banks with Persistent Weaknesses. This is a, a new um, appendix, um, but what it does is really lays out more clearly um, expectations actually for um, what the regulators would do if a bank was having persistent weaknesses. And persistent weaknesses are things like um, when uh, the banks are, are unable to address um, their matters requiring attention and um, uh, perhaps enforcement actions or things like that um, and uh, in, in a timely way or address other weaknesses that the bank has. And so um, what it does is set out a series of expectations and generally of an increasing nature. So the regulator would be expected to um, take action you know, against the bank. And that could include um, a formal enforcement action um, if they are unable to address these weaknesses. And ultimately, it could include um, things like requiring the bank to uh, reduce its operations, reduce the size of its assets, um, you know, divest of subsidiaries or business lines, um, exit from particular markets and they specifically lay out um, those as potential actions. So I, I think it makes it clear, um, you know, for the banks and I think it makes it um, more uh, clear for the regulators what action they need to be taking along this path, if you will, if uh, these uh, persistent weaknesses are allowed to continue. So it's really a strengthening of the examination process and frankly putting in a lot of um, more specific and tangible teeth in that examination process if things go unchecked. So, you know, maybe a small change, but could have a big change on behavior and actions on some of the banks. Got it. Well, um, we did get some news last week. Um, there's an old joke that the FDIC stands for forever demanding increased capital. And on that note, um, there was New capital requirements uh, rolled out for banks over 100 billion assets. I believe the whole proposal was 1,100 pages, I heard. And on average, it's going to lead to a 16% increase in common equity tier one capital requirements for affected bank holding companies. Uh, banks under 100 billion will not be affected by this unless they have significant trading activity. Is this a good idea? And how will this impact the system? Chris, what do you think of this proposal? 
Well, we knew it was coming, so I wasn't terribly shocked by it. Um, you know, it is a reaction to what tra- transpired in March and in April with uh, Silicon Valley Signature and uh, First Republic. Um, you know, if we had, had, had enforced the rules that were in place in the first uh, in the first go round, we wouldn't have to put new rules in. But um, that's another conversation for another day. Uh, we are going to see these rules. I, I think the regional banks, using Fifth Third as an example, who was very vocal about the need to build liquidity, the need to kind of be prepared, uh, not only for the uh, capital uh, definition to change so that, you know, the ex- exclusion of AOCI or um, unrealized losses on available for sale, that that was going to go away. So the banks above uh, $100 billion would be judged just like Bank of America in terms of that those unrealized losses are included. That's that's one change that is definite and I, I think is unlikely to, to be moved. And then um, the buildup of liquidity for a kind of full liquidity coverage ratio or LCR also seems like it's in the cards. Now, there's the public comment period for the next few months. Um, there will be, I'm sure, some type of lobby from the larger banks to try to modify some of this. I'm not expecting much to change, but we'll see. Um, and I think ultimately the biggest piece of this, John, is that it's a long phase in. So it's a multi year phase in. And that's important for two reasons. One, the banks can earn additional capital in Crete, which I think they will, just for normal organic purposes. Building up capital over two or three years is is very important. And then B, I think you'll see a lot of securities get paid off in that time frame. So while banks have securities that may have six-year durations, remember that those were put in place in 2021. So we've already had two years expire on that six years. So as you go forward, the next two or three years will have some meaningful payoffs. Um, one statistic that's important is that Fifth Third is seeing about 45% of their um, unrealized losses go back to par by the end of 29 or to 2024. So looking out 18 months, they'll see a chunk of their uh, AOCI or un realized losses come back to them. They still have to think of the other 55%, so they're not completely out of the woods, but it's better than it was. And again, I think you'll see that the um, additional capital that these large regional banks have to hold can be kind of assimilated over this multi-year time frame. So I think it's a lot of barking, and the actual bite is not as bad. Um, you know, the lasting change is going to be the liquidity coverage ratio, which is definitely higher than it was. Uh, but that too, I think banks can handle. Um, it's just you know not their preference, but I think they can handle it. Jason, add any thoughts on, on it? Yeah, I, I, I go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd add on to. You know Chris's comments. Um, you know it, it's it's a big and complex proposal. Um, you know as noted, you know 1,100 pages. Um, you know typically regulators ask questions where um, they're looking for input from the industry. In this proposal, they asked 176 questions. I think that gives you a sense of the complexity of issues that are in there. That they have asked so many questions. Um, you know Chris talked a little bit about the. Uh, comment period and also the phase in period, those are both um, longer than normal for many uh, regulatory rulemakings. And I think those are also uh, factors that are indicative of the complexity. Um, you know, the, the, you know, Chris talked about the AOCI, which is interesting. Um, in other words, the unrealized gains and losses included. Out, out of all the changes, that's probably the one where you can tie it back to an underlying factor and what happened in the March and April. Um, you know, bank crisis. Um, the, those banks had obviously unrealized losses in their portfolios, and that's that's the one change. There's there's many changes in terms of uh, capital methodologies, um, both the fundamental methodologies as well as um, factors. Um, it's gotten a lot of criticism already, and I think it'll get a lot more criticism, frankly, in the time to come. Um, I think for some banks, it's it's not a small thing. Most of our banks are well capitalized, but um, I, I think in the proposal, uh, they talked about a 16% capital increase. I've seen other estimates that say that for larger banks, that could be 24%. I was on a, I think the DPI has said that for some individual banks, it could be up to 40% capital increase. But those are sizable um, increases, which will have a major impact on, you know, return on capital uh, of the bank. And also, um, many of the changes that are being made are being made in a way that they're uh, determined or calibrated or tweaked 
by the US regulators. And that diverges from the international standards that are set through something called the Basel Committee. And the upshot of that is that, that US banks operating under these rules would have different capital standards, higher capital standards than foreign banks operating under the Basel standards. And as a result, there's a level playing field issue and foreign banks could be advantaged to perhaps um, you know, lend or conduct uh, banking activities you know, in the US on an advantage basis as a result of that. Um, maybe an, another interesting thing is, you know, that Jason, I come in here, but um, a lot of what the um, proposed regulation actually does is um, make adjustments at this $100 billion bucket, um, which was set in law in 2018 under so-called tailoring law that tailored the requirements of Dodd-Frank. And the idea was that after a period of time, uh, it was felt that you know, for smaller banks that um, that could be adjusted. Um, and it's interesting that the regulators are in effect, um, de facto changing a legislation with a regulation. And that could possibly be another source of um, complaint or criticism. So I, I think this thing is gonna have a lot of discussion uh, going forward. I think Chris talked about various lobbies or things like that. Um, you know, th this is not gonna be something that's just gonna go in uh, without you know people saying their piece. It, it's, this is gonna be a very uh, contentious issue going forward. Well, you know, Ed, Ed touched on one piece that I was gonna mention, which is this is sort of the regulators taking a second bite at the apple at $100 billion greater banks, right? Um, after, after in some cases, moving the threshold up to 250, and so you know very clearly the regulators are are seeing that 100 billion dollar be an important threshold. Um, but I would hope that in any final rule, it's it's exactly that that there aren't all these complexities that could submit you to certain capital requirements based on you know level activity of trading or this or that. I mean, I really think that if there are these capital rules, it should be based on your your overall assets. Um, and, uh, you know, again, would I question the timing because um, everything that Chris made sense, everything Chris said made sense in the sense that, you know, for some banks uh, that are six years or maybe 10 years on their securities that, you know, they'll naturally get that pick up. Um, but, you know, in the short term, in the next two years, you potentially have banks with very low earnings and the requirement to increase HFL. And so, you know, I would. I have not read all 1,100 pages, so I have to confess that. But I would hope that the ultimate final timing would be would take into account the fact that we're in a rough patch in terms of you know, the, the relative capital strength of, of banks right now versus where they're going to be 18 months from now, even without these rules. It sounds like the um, stock buybacks and so on will be uh, restricted to some extent to allow these banks to boost their capital levels. Um, a couple of thoughts on the uh, CRE fruit and workout guidance. So you can bring up that presentation. Um, in short, um, the change 30 days ago to the original 2009 policy statement on prudent commercial real estate loan accommodation workouts has not changed much. I did a red line of both documents. Um, the principles um, haven't changed. Um, they're encouraging banks to do prudent workouts. Um, they certainly want banks to know what they're getting into and get, get updated financials. Um, you know, the key thing here is you're not gonna punish a borrower that can cash flow a debt solely because the value of the collateral has declined. Um, they did add a new section for short-term loan accommodations, continued focus on global cash flow of the borrower, Sounds like we're going to bring back the A and B structures from the last cycle. And obviously there were changes here to reflect Cecil. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, my view, the big issue with this is, you know, back in 2009, um, we had rates at near zero. So you did have borrowers that had the ability to repay those loans, um, but their collateral was now impaired. In this environment, it's a lot different. Um, now you have elevated interest rates. So you actually may have more situations where the loan itself is not underwater, um, but the higher debt doesn't allow the, the loan to cash flow. Um, uh, there's an example from a prior 
presentation we did on the Apple's Way Investment Group. This was a, a deal done in Texas where a syndicator bought a few apartment buildings, some of which have done 80% leverage. Their interest rate went from 3.4 to 8%. And you can see in our estimate of cash flow on these multifamily properties that a 125 became a 0.76 when rates moved from three and a half to eight. So, you know, what's unique this time around is the rate environment is obviously much different. We go to the next slide. Overall, credit quality um, is showing some weakness. Um, we use the CMBS data, thanks to our friends from TREP. Um, you can see the uptick in delinquencies month to month on CMBS loans. Banks don't provide this level of detail with respect to delinquencies by property type. So it's good to use the CMBS data here, although there's obviously differences between bank loans and CMBS loans. We go another slide. The um, you know overall uh, credit picture is, is weakening. Um, but not a whole lot, not something to be alarmed about. We did see an almost 8% increase in NPAs. This is from the four largest banks. Um, but you can see those NPA ratios are still very low. The industry-wide NPA ratio, that's NPAs as a percentage of assets, is at 0.40%. Average is one and a quarter to 2%. So, you know, we all expect NPAs to pick up a lot. Um, but they're coming, they're picking up from a very low level. You can see the four largest banks increased provisions by 44% from the prior quarter. Charge offs were up 15%. So credit quality is certainly worsening, um, but there's still plenty of cash um, COVID stimulus left in the system. Next slide. Um, this is real important. So Fifth Third, I can keep talking about Fifth Third. Um, I guess they do a good job in presenting what's going on. Um, but keep in mind that to the extent that we're going to have problems, we believe it's the commercial market that's going to lead it. Um, only 11% of all consumer loans are floating rate. Um, you can see from Fifth Third's presentation, they broke down commercial loans versus consumer loans and their, their interest rate sensitivity. Um, you could see on the on the commercial side on the left, 72% um, of the CNI loans are variable. That's 74% of their book. 57% of commercial mortgages are variable, and the entire duration of the entire commercial book at Fifth Third is 1.9 years. So the reality is, commercial loans are going to get hit by higher rates. Either either they're, they're getting hit now, or they will get hit um, due to the short maturity. That's it with my presentation. Um, any thoughts on uh, what we just what I just talked about? I wanted to chime in. I, I think it's sensible and well timed. You know, the, clearly, uh, you know, making the uh, guidance on uh, forbearance and uh, uh, workouts uh, more clear that those are accepted methodologies at this time is is helpful. And, and helpful for banks. So I, I think it's that's sensible. Yeah, I mean, there was this narrative that the uh, regionals were losing deposits to large banks. How could these regionals compete? Um, Chris, how has that narrative changed? Uh, obviously, we just went through a bunch of earnings, but um, any thoughts on how the uh, regionals compete with the largest banks? Well, I think the deposit outflows <clears throat> have been a lot more muted and not as bad as advertised. If you go back to all the uh, noise on TV and in uh, the media in the month of March and April, there's a lot of misinformation that proved to be not true. Uh, most banks actually had deposits uh, flat to up in terms of their period balances. If you look at you know uh, deposits X CDs, they're down, uh, but they're down in that sort of four or five percent range, which is consistent with the Fed data year over year. And honestly, I don't think it's any better at J.P. Morgan and Bank America than it is at you know Wintrust and other banks. I think it's actually very similar. Um, so the idea that the large banks are taking share from the regionals is just not true. Um, I think from a compete standpoint. Banks have to charge more for loans. Uh, there's a um, historically low spread between Fed funds and what banks are charging on loans, and I think that will change. I think there is um, some changes going on in terms of timing that's going to be helpful. It's one of the reasons why net interest margin 
has a chance of stabilizing at year end, not necessarily today, but by um, end of the year, which is prospectively better for 2024. Um, but I think certainly from a competition standpoint, it comes back to relationships and people and how good those are on the ground. And that's a case to case standpoint. You've got some really good banks who do very well and others that follow up. And so, you know, that's the movement. And I think there still is movement of personnel from one bank to the other, and he or she will move their book of business. That still is happening out there. And we particularly see that uh, in the mid-size arena a lot, leaving the big national companies going to mid-size players. Just, you know, Wintrust is a good example. Chicago, Pinnacle Financial is a good example. Synovus, another good example in the Southeast, and there are many others. Um, that's one of the reasons Bank of California wanted to marry with PacWest. They think they can resuscitate some of those relationships, given that uh, First Republic and Silicon Valley uh, left uh, the scene and that there's a you know wide open opportunity set there. So Chris, you know, you work with a lot of community banks, Jason. Uh, how are they competing with uh, their larger brethren? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know that you necessarily see community banks. I, I think competition is the wrong word. I mean, community banks are, are tend to be sort of the, the pillar of their immediate community. And then, um, you know, as, as a borrower starts to get on a you know, larger national regional basis, they, they tend to gravitate to, to the larger banks. I think, though, um, just to follow up on, on Chris's comment, just and it, it'll touch on your question, John, is that, you know, from a competitive standpoint, banks are really only chasing loans that are those relationships right now so they can get the deposits, right? And as, you know, both Ed and Chris were talking about earlier and, and just a few minutes ago as well, um, you know, with net interest margin, um, cost deposits has skyrocketed. Now, I don't want to say that's a relative skyrocket, right? It's still around probably 2%. But relative to what it was, uh, you know, just 15 months ago, it's skyrocketed. And I think that um, the competitive problem here is that as you're chasing a deal, you want those deposits, but that that loan is just going to be at a, such a higher rate than what our borrowers have been used to. Yeah. yeah. And any thoughts? No, I I, I agree with. Uh, my colleagues here. <laughs> so yeah. we'll get there. Well, this has been a, a, a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, Bob, why don't you take us away? We have a couple questions. Um, this is from me for Chris. Um, Chris, I'm a big stats guy. I love your charts. On this chart, my niche is small business lending. Where would you put small business loans on this? I know the data is very difficult, so I'm asking for an opinion. But on this rank, what, what would you guess the small business loan defaults are and the uh, your estimate of losses or the implied losses on those portfolios? Sure. So if we think about uh, small business loans, particularly being C&I driven, um, you know, backed by cash flow and not by real estate per se, I think that you're going to find that defaults are probably, I think, higher than the, sure. the total number. So if we have 12 and a half from the Fed study, I'd put maybe 18 to 20 wow. would be the default rate for small business. Um, now, remember, you know, we're talking of things outside of the SBA. <clears throat> the SBA clearly muddies the waters. It's a great program, but it does muddy the data. But I'm thinking of, you know, pure small businesses that do business. Um, and again, we may find that these numbers are too conservative. And I say that because we have more and more conversations from banks who are suggesting that small businesses have delevered. They are sitting on cash. They certainly had some of the stimulus dollars from 21, 22, and even early this year. And that has helped them not be upside down like they may have been in past cycles. So that could limit the default rate, uh, but we don't know that yet. So I'm going to take the other side of the coin and be conservative and, and, and you know, presume that it's going to be a higher number. I still think it's something that banks can, can reserve for and charge off over time. And I think time is the key. I mean, this is to me a three-year process that has started you know, first, second quarter of this year, it will go into 25. Um, the good news is banks have cash flow. They can handle it. Um, you know, the cash flow is narrower than it was because of net interest income and margin coming down, but it's still pretty good. You know, we think the cash flow is still 80 to 85% of what we thought it was going to be um, this year. So, you know, we still have a pretty good amount. And cumulatively over two and a half and three years, it's a pretty good pool that banks have to kind of work through the issues they have.
So long, long answer to a simple question, but that's kind of how we think no, it through. No, that's great. That, I like that. You, you, you have it underneath CRE, below credit cards, but obviously above C&I, so that makes sense. Another question, Bob? I do. Uh, we had a great discussion last time on geography. Um, same question, same just summary. Basically, any, uh, any outliers in geography we need to be aware of? As far as bank performance or, or loan? Yeah, I know last time, we, for example, San Francisco office, we were very, sure. we were negative on that. Is there anything, I guess, following up on that, has anything yeah. changed in the last three months? That's my question. Well, I mean, I, I, th I find it somewhat amusing that every bank is trying to point out how their office loans are not downtown, um, they're <laughs> class A, non downtown. And I'm not so sure. I necessarily see that in my space. I mean, I see plenty of suburban office buildings that are having problems. Uh, I'm not so sure this downtown bad um, suburban good model makes a whole lot of sense. I think the challenge in office, you know, exists no matter where they are. I mean, you know, um, long commutes are, you know, are out of fashion. And, um, you know, one thing I noticed is it's hard to mix business and pleasure now because typically I'd go to a place like New York, spend the weekend, um, but I can't see people on Friday and I can't see people on Monday because people aren't in the office, especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say, yeah, I mean, overall, um, certainly, you know, the more urban, the more downtown the portfolio is, the more challenging it's going to be. But um, I don't I, I think that narrative can be a little bit simplistic. I got a, a question from the audience. Do we expect most banks to continue to follow fifth thirds forecasting model? of large chunk of unrealized losses uh, will return to par? Um, I think the answer is yes. I think that it, the percentage will be less than Fifth Third. Fifth Third had a fair amount of securities that were structured as bullet maturities, so they behave differently. A lot of folks who were buying um, longer uh, maturities that, who had different structure aren't, aren't going to see as quick of an amortization. I think a good rule of thumb is maybe a percent and a half per quarter is what um, I think is a minimum number that will come back, particularly because every bank has a fair amount of the uh, residential mortgage-backed securities pools. Those are and uh, loans all amortized, just like you know all of our houses uh, amortized with mortgages. So um, that's how those um, securities perform, and they're all generally uh, good from a credit perspective. We haven't had any uh, threats to those uh, so far. Knock on wood. Very good, John. We are clearing questions. Go ahead. Excellent. Well, this has uh, been an excellent discussion once again. Uh, it's great to bring back the uh, original Fab Four, I guess and uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you for, for coming and uh, thank you, Jason, Jason, Ed, and, um, and Chris, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everyone.